Welcome back to AMS 2940 Lecture 2. Today we're going to look at a couple of things. One is we are going to look at the uh, some of the dual ideas uh, about something called shadow price. And secondly, we're going to take a closer look at solving linear programs using Excel. We kind of touched on this while we had class time but we're going to look a little bit more at the solution that you can get out of Excel and what some of the numbers mean in there. So we're going to work with this linear program. We have a company that assembles three types of toys using three operations, different assembly times for the three operations, only so much time available, prop, different profits for the different products, and the, the assembly times required for each of the processes. Now this is a pretty standard linear program so hopefully you should be able to put it into linear program form now into and when you do that you will get you will get this maximizing that that equation subject to three constraints with everything being greater than or equal to zero and put it into that tableau. Now we can solve this out using the simplex method or now we can use it solve it out using Excel and we're going to solve that using Excel in a minute but we're going to look at some of the uh, some some of the implications of this so when we write this program out with slack variables here's what we get from our initial program so we've just added in the slack variables s1 s2 and s3 we get equalities so for any feasible point, no matter where it is, you have to have these equalities satisfied. Now remember, when we have a problem like this, we're saying we let some of our variables equal zero, we're saying let those equal to zero to get our basic feasible point. For those variables, that's the values of them. Once you have that, and you put it in here, it has to satisfy those equations. If you if you change some of your values, so in other words, if you stray off of your basic feasible point, for instance, if you let x1, our basic feasible point here, x1 is zero. Let's say we let x1 equal one. Well, for this formulation of the problem, you still have to have those constraints satisfied. So how does that change your variables? X1 and X2 don't have to change, but you are forced to change S1, S2, and X3, S3 when we increase X1. And how do, we, how do they have to change? If X1 goes up by one, S1 has to go down by one. With our second equation, if X1 goes up by one, S2 has to go down by three, because we have three X1, you increase X1 by one, that goes up by three, so S2 has to go down by three. For our third one, if X1 goes up by one, S3 has to go down by one. It's the only way to change X1 and still leave these constraints these equality constraints being satisfied. You change one variable, it has an impact on the other variables. So what do, impact does that have on our objective function? Well, our objective function was here. You increase x1 by one, obviously your objective function goes up by three, okay? So he, this is kind of looking at a sensitivity which we've done before, and we're saying if we change the value of one of our variables, how does it impact on the other variables and on the objective function? Knowing that the constraints still have to be satisfied. It in this case, it changes our slack variables, but it does change our objective function. So that's for that statement of the problem. When we solve it out after optimization, it's the same problem. All we've done is a bunch of substitutions, 
but we can ask the same questions now. After we optimize, we get this. So we have our objective function is minus 4x1 minus s1 minus, wait, minus s1 s1 minus s2 2s2 plus 1350 that's equal to z that's what we're maximizing so there's our objective function we have these constraints again just reading off and this is rearranging them a little bit but again we have that our constraints have to be satisfied so now we can ask again what happens if we increase s1 for x1 don't change our other variables on the top here so those don't change but what about the other variables what happens well if we increase x1 by 1 this says that x2 well if we increase x1 by 1 x1 we have minus 1 fourth x1 that goes down by a fourth so x2 has to go up by 1 fourth for here increase x1 by 1 that goes up by 3 halves so x3 has to go down 3 halves here it goes up 2 so s3 has to go down 2 what happens to our objective function for z when you look in here what happens x1 goes up by 1 z goes down by 4 okay so you can see here how changing one variable has an impact on the other variables knowing that you have to still meet these equality constraints but now what does this tell us this is just summarizing what i just said that what happens when x1 goes up by one the other variables have to change some of the other variables and how does it change the objective function by negative four this slide is just repeating what i just said so now keep in mind this we changed z or we changed x1 by one what happened to z it went down by four take a look at your final tableau final tableau x1 minus four this is what we call a reduced cost this is the impact on your 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 function your objective function when you increase that variable by one it has some other interpretations as well it can also be interpreted as the minimum increase that must take place in the objective function coefficient of this variable before this variable becomes basic in the optimal solution another way to interpret this value is the penalty that has to be paid to introduce one unit of the variable into the solution that's what we just talked about if we want to introduce one more x1 into the solution what's the penalty we pay we pay the penalty of minus four this is a second way of thinking about it it's the minimum increase that must take place in the objective function uh, coefficient before this variable becomes basic okay. so that's more in line with what we were talking about with our our um, um, our some of our analysis the final tableau when we've optimized it also gives information on what we call the shadow price or it's sometimes called the dual price so 
What is the shadow price or a dual price? What's the difference? These are the numbers down here. If we go back here, we had something called the reduced cost. We normally talk about the reduced cost in association with variables that were in your objective function to start with. The S1 and S2 are your slack variables that we started with. Normally when we talk about dealing with with those variables, we have the same concept, but we call it a shadow price or a dual price. So here, the shadow price of S1 is negative one, or is one, and the shadow price of S2 is two. And these variables are associated with the original constraints from our original problem. So in other words, S1 was our first constraint and S2 dealt with our second constraint. So shadow prices or dual prices deal with your original constraints. And what does this mean? This, this number is the improvement that you get in your objective function if you relax that constraint. So in our objective function, our original constraint was that constraint one had to be less than or equal to 430. When it's 430, we had a maximum value of 1350. The shadow price is saying, well, if we relax that from 430 to 431, what kind of improvement are we gonna make? That will go up to 1351. Our second constraint, originally it was less than or equal to 460. Well, what happens if you change that 460 to 461? That tells you your objective function is going to go up by two. So if you suddenly have an extra hour to put towards something, where do you put it? Do you put it towards uh, process one, two, or three? This tells you that process two, an improvement of one hour in that process, gives you a benefit of $2. Process one, it has a benefit of $1. Process three, it actually says you have a benefit of zero. So your shadow prices, which are associated with your slack variables, which have become basic, those, ver those shadow prices tell you the benefit of getting extra time or of relaxing that constraint. You can also think of it in terms of the price that should be paid for the purchase of additional units. So in other words, for constraint one, which was process one, how much are you gonna pay for another hour of that? Well, if you can pay somebody less than a dollar for it, you're getting a net benefit. For process two, if somebody comes along and says, well, for $3, I can give you an extra hour, this tells you you only get a $2 benefit. It's not worth paying $3. So it's essentially the cost of that process. Now, we're going to take a look at this particular problem in Excel. And first, we only had one chance to do this in class, so I'm gonna step through building this problem in Excel again. First off, we have our variables, x1, x2, and x3. We have to give values to our variables. What are they? Start out with zero, easiest way. Now, we have to code in here our objective function and our constraints. So I'll start with the objective function. What are the coefficients on our objective function? If we go back to our problem, our objective function was 3x1 plus 2x2 plus 5x3. And what does that all equal? Well, I'm going to use something called sum product in Excel which takes two arrays and multiplies them together term-wise. 
Uh, if you aren't familiar with this, you can do it out a little bit longer, but it's a good idea to become familiar with this. So that array times that array, and it does it entry-wise. And so you can see, if you change that to one, you can see it automatically updates the number. But we'll start out with everything being zero. Now we have to put in our constraints. So our first constraint had, was x1 plus 2x2 plus 5x3 is less than or equal to 430. And again, I have to calculate what the value of that constraint is. So I can just copy the formula here. And again, you'll if you're familiar with Excel, you'll note I used absolute references for one array and I used relative references for the other. If you aren't familiar with Excel, you have to be a little bit more careful here to make sure that you are multiplying the right things. Our second constraint was 3x1 plus 2x3 is less than or equal to 460. And again, we have to calculate out the value of the equation for that constraint. Our third constraint was 1x1 plus 4x2 plus 0x3 is less than or equal to 420. Okay. So there is our linear program written out in Excel. Now let's solve it. We go to Solver, which is under Data in Excel. Again, if you don't see Solver in there, you can add it in. Just do a Google search on how to add Solver into Excel. Set our objective. So our objective is that value right there, the calculated value of our objective. We want to maximize it, so that's already correct. By changing variable cells, here's the values of your variables. So you select all those. Subject to the constraints, so we add a constraint. So the calculated value of my first constraint has to be less than or equal to the calculated the value 430. Add that in. Our second constraint, the calculated value, which was right there, is less than or equal to 460. And finally, the calculated value of my last one is less than or equal to 420. And now I have my whole problem in the solver. I, everything has to be non-negative, so I leave that, that checked. If you have some unconstrained variables, then you can uncheck that. And then any constrained variables, you have to make sure that they're equal to zero by putting in a new constraint or greater than or equal to zero. We want to solve it with the simplex linear program. We solve. We have a solution. Oops. I entered 461 here, not 460. Sorry, I entered the wrong number. So we solve it. The linear program is still in there. We solve it. We have the value 1350, which was what we saw a minute ago. But this time, I'm going to get a report. So I'm going to click on the sensitivity report and click on OK. And it gives me this, the sensitivity report. Now let's look at interpreting this. If we go back to our solution on our PowerPoint slide, here, and let's take off these lines to make it a little bit easier. Okay, so here was our, our final tableau that gives us the solution. You can see 1350 being, the, being in the tableau, which is exactly what we had. Across the top, our basic variables were x1, s1, and s2. So let's start with x1. x1, here's our reduced cost. Again, the penalty you pay by introducing one more unit of that, uh, of that item. It gives you the objective coefficient. So when we first started, we had 3x1. That's, that's just giving you the, uh, the amount. It also gives the allowable increase and allowable decrease. 
Remember when we did sensitivity analysis, we talked about what is the allowable increase in a coefficient in our, in our problem before we have to pivot again. Excel gives you that right away. It says this three, our original objective function was 3x1 plus 2x2 plus 5x3. This says our three can go up four, it can go up to seven before we have to pivot again. How far can it go down? Well, this says it can go down forever. Our x2, what does it say? Well, we started with our objective function being 2x2. It says you can put up to by eight, so you can put up to 10, or you can put it down to zero and you won't impact your, your solution. Same here, x3, and again, point out here, x3 and x2 are non-basic variables here. So x3 can go down, the coefficient on x3 can go down forever and it won't impact your solution. It can go up by two and two thirds, so it can go up to seven and two thirds before you have to pivot again. Okay. So all of the sensitivity analysis, all those calculations we did, you know, with the S plus H and then calculating it out, Excel gives it all to you right here. And you can see for X1, one of the things we did was if we had, we saw that if we change X1, then it has an impact on Z. Well, this says x1 started out as 3 in, your, in our original objective function. We can put it up to 7. Every time we put it up, we reduce our benefit by $4. So if it goes up from 3 to 5, the value of our objective function drops by 8. If it goes up from 3 to 7, it drops by 16. If it goes up from 3 to 8, so it goes up 5 points, we don't know. We have to pivot again. We're only allowed to go up by four units to figure out our reduced cost or to use our reduced cost to figure out the new value of the objective function without having to pivot again. So this table gives you your sensitivity analysis for your variables. Now, let's look at the constraints. It gives us a lot of information about the constraints as well. If we look on our tableau, we had shadow prices, we called them. Shadow price of one for S1 and a shadow price for two of S2. And this was saying, what if we relax our B value, our constraint value? Right here, you can see your shadow price. So our constraint had a limit of 430 for our first constraint. It says that, or sorry, our constraint originally had 430. Our shadow price is one, which says every time we relax that constraint, the value of our objective function goes up by one. How far can we do that? Well, we can go up by 10. We can go up as far as 440, and we can go down 200. We can go down as far as 230. As soon as you cross those limits, you have to repivot. But if your constraint, it was 430 hours limit, if we go up to 435 hours, that's within our allowable increase, it goes up by five. One, our shadow price tells us for every unit of, of uh, every unit you put up that constraint, what's your benefit. For S2, your second equation, your second constraint from your original constraints. It was 460. This one, you can bump up all the way to 860 by 400 points before you have to repivot. If you can bump it up, every one you bump it up, every relaxation of it, so if you put it up by 100, you get a benefit of 200. But you can only go down by 20. So if all of a sudden your machine breaks down and you lose 20 hours, what do you lose? You lose $2 for every hour. So if you lose 20 hours, you would lose $40. If you lose 40 hours on that machine, you have to repivot. You're outside of your constraints. 
And your third value, S3, well, you see S3 stayed on the right-hand side. What that means is that you haven't reached that constraint. You have fallen 20 short of that constraint. You aren't using that process or that machine for the full time allowable. So you can see here, the value is 400 because there's 20 hours you didn't use. So what does this mean in terms of your sensitivity? Well, it says that you can put that number up infinitely many. It isn't going to make a difference. And it has a shadow price of zero. So your objective function doesn't change. You can only put it down by 20 before your objective function changes. Then you have to repivot. So this sensitivity report in Excel gives you the sensitivity that I made you do all these calculations for. You can just read it off here, but you have to understand what, what the numbers mean. All right, thanks for your attention.